that's that quick little blurb. But the main reason I'm really excited is because tonight we're starting our series in Daniel. And uh, seriously, as pumped as I am for the dance party, I'm more pumped for this. Uh, God has really been moving in my heart through this uh, book of the Bible, through the, my study that I've been doing of the character of Daniel, and I'm just pumped for tonight. I, uh, It's impacted me, and so I think it's going to impact you as well. So I want to start by asking a question. Are you useful to God? Do you want to be useful to God? Raise your hand if you want to be useful to God. Okay, it's most of us. Uh, so I'm not asking the question, can God use me? I think most of us, uh, if you're acquainted with your Bible at all, would probably say, yeah, God could use me. God can use anybody, can't he? I mean, God like speaks through donkeys at points in the Bible. Surely God could use me. And I would agree, God uses a lot of not great people. I mean, he even uses Pharaoh in Exodus to display his glory. So whether you want to be used by God or not, God can use anyone. But the question I want to ask is, are you useful to God? And you might say, okay, if God can use anyone, why does it matter if I'm useful or not? What does that have to do with anything since God can use anyone? And that just takes me to a verse of scripture that God has been impressing upon my heart for probably the last six months or so. And uh, so you've maybe heard me mention it before. It's from 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21. It says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, they're useful, and some for common use. So you've got the trash can for common use, and you've got the fine china for special purposes. You know, you've got the toilet, very common use, and you've got you know, your super comfy lounge chair that's very special to you. And we, in a sense, get to choose. Are we going to be God's trash can or God's comfy lounge chair. <laughs> Those who cleanse themselves from the latter, that is, the, the worldly sinful practices, will be instruments for special purposes. Made holy. That's a sort of a buzzword from this past year. We've been talking about holiness. Holiness means to be set apart. It means to be different. And that's our whole theme for this year. We're talking about being different. And my favorite phrase is that last one. Useful to the master, prepared to do any good work. So the question is, are you useful to God? Those of us who are set apart, different, holy, have an opportunity to be used by God in very special, purposeful ways. Those of us who pursue other worldly, perhaps sinful things, uh, maybe God will use us, but he'll use us in spite of ourselves, not because we're particularly useful uh, it's, it's, it's like choosing between a life of purpose and a life that's frankly pointless. Not that your life doesn't have any worth at all, but when you add up your life at the end of the day and you look at the impact that you've made, the difference that you've made in the world, especially the difference you've made for the kingdom of God, there are millions, billions of people who live and die and you add up the sum total of their life and it's goose egg pointless. So the question is, are we going to be people that serve purpose or that live pointless lives? Daniel was different. Daniel served a purpose. Daniel was a special individual, and I say he was special because he was specially used by God. He was useful but he wasn't necessarily special in that he's anything that you and I couldn't be. As I'm reading this, I, I'm looking at the life of Daniel, and it's just made me think, could this be me? Could this be some of the students here tonight? Is there a way that God could use us in the same way that he used Daniel? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, there's nothing intrinsically special about Daniel. He's a regular guy, just like many of us. And yet, he was useful. He served purpose. So, 
We're going to spend the next six weeks looking at his life. Today we'll be in Daniel chapter 1, and we'll tackle one chapter each week until we get to Daniel 6. Now that won't cover the entire book of Daniel, but that will cover the major narrative portions of the book of Daniel. So we'll hear all of the stories that you've come to know and love. Daniel in the lion's den, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fiery furnace, and, uh, and others that you're familiar with. But before we jump into Daniel 1... I want to take a moment to pray, and I want you to pray along with me, okay? I'm just going to be quiet up here for a few seconds while you pray quietly to yourselves, and as you pray, I want you to pray for three things. First, I want you to pray for me. Um, I really appreciate that last song that we sang tonight, Lord, I need you. Uh, I'm jacked about what God has been teaching me through Daniel, but if I'm just up here regurgitating facts that I've learned over the past few weeks, it's not going to do anybody any real lasting good. I want to serve purpose. I want to be useful, and in order for real change to take place in your hearts, the Holy Spirit needs to be speaking through me. So, first of all, pray for me. Pray that it would be God's words, not my words. Pray that my thoughts would be clear and coherent and that I'll speak nothing more or less than what God wants you to hear tonight. Second of all, pray for yourselves. Uh, I've talked with a number of you today. Some of you guys are very tired. You're sleepy. You've had a long day. And for that, I'm sorry. Uh, It is my hope that you will not be bored to sleep tonight. Uh, Maybe one thing that we can do is we could pray and ask God for help. God, what do you want me to hear tonight? What do you want me to take away? And if sleepiness or distraction, your phone's blowing up, the test that's coming up tomorrow is on your mind, maybe we could pray and say, God, help me to focus now on what you want me to take away from tonight. And then I'll dance my sleep away later tonight, okay? So pray for yourselves. And lastly, pray for someone who's hurting, okay? whether that's somebody you know that doesn't know Jesus or somebody that's going through a particular trial. Pray for me, pray for you, pray for someone who's hurting, and then I'll close our time in prayer and we'll jump into the book of Daniel, okay? Let's pray. Lord, we need you tonight. Pray that you would speak through me, speak through your word, help your word to be a swift word that moves quickly from our ears to our hearts. Help us to be changed by it. Transformed by your spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've said that God can use anyone. But how do we be useful to God? Are there certain character traits that someone could possess that would lead to them being a useful person. Someone who has purpose versus pointlessness. A life of purpose versus a life that's pointless. And as we look at the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel chapter 1 tonight, uh, we're going to be asking that question, how do I choose a life of purpose versus a life that's pointless? Pointless seems like a bit of a harsh word, I know, but frankly... That's where some of you guys are heading, a life that is totally pointless, and we want to be people of purpose. Before we get too deep into that, though, I want to set up the story, and we're going to do that by reading the first few verses of Daniel chapter 1. So if you've got a Bible, open it up. If you've got an app, open that up to Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read the first six verses to sort of set up our story. Who's Daniel? Maybe there's someone here that's never heard any stories of Daniel before. You're unfamiliar with this part of the Bible, and it's a joy to be able to share with you one of the coolest guys ever. And uh, so I'm going to start reading from Daniel chapter 1. I'll have the verses on the screen as well. It'll be in the NIV on the screen if you want to use follow along in a different translation. That's fine too, but here's what it says. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. 
Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We'll stop there for now. We're introduced here to our main characters. We've got Daniel, and we've got three of his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And these are four out of a group of young people that were taken captive from Jerusalem and taken into captivity in Babylon. Now, Scholars tell us that when Babylon conquered nations, they would often take groups of young, noble, uh, young men like this. And most of the time, these groups were between 50 and 75 people. And so we think that Daniel was a part of this size of a group, probably less than 100 people at this point. So we're not talking mass uh, deportation at this point, although that would come later in Israel's history. Uh, But between 50 and 75 people of whom Daniel and his friends were four of them, and they were essentially to be taken as hostages. Uh, They were from the nobles and the royalty in Israel, and so you've got the people that are high up in Israel, and their kids are all basically being held hostage to make sure that if Israel tries to rebel against Babylon, there's not going to be any funny business, because there's 50 to 75 of their children that are being held hostage, essentially. And... The Bible speaks to these as young men. So I don't know what kind of picture you have of Daniel in your mind, but if he's a middle-aged guy with, you know, hair that's getting gray and maybe starting to bald and he's got a full beard and all of that, for now, I want you to discard that picture. We'll get to that point in Daniel's life later. Right now, Daniel is between 13 and 15 years old which is a very important fact for you guys because many of you are between 13 and 15 years old. And if you're a junior or a senior in here, then maybe you can think, wow, this is somebody that's even younger than I am. And we're going to see Daniel making some really mature decisions, but that should make us want to live like that, right? This isn't some superhero. This isn't some person that's been walking with Jesus for 60 years and now they're, you know, finally presented with this big test. This is someone your age who's faced with an incredibly difficult situation and yet Daniel and his friends, we're going to see them rise to the occasion. And that could be you and that could be me when we're faced with difficulty. And we'll talk more about that. But we've, uh, I said that these were hostages, and they were, uh, but you'll notice that they weren't just being thrown into a prison and treated like slaves. There's actually an interesting situation going on here. They're being taught and instructed in the ways of the Babylonians. They're being given food from the king's table. Like, what's, what's all this about? Well, the Babylonians were smart. They weren't just interested in taking a bunch of prisoners. They wanted some people that knew the culture and the language and the traditions of the nations that they captured, but who that they could then twist to follow Babylonian ideas. What's actually happening within these verses is Daniel and his friends are a part of a group of people that are essentially being brainwashed by the Babylonians. The Babylonians want people that know the language and the traditions of Israel, but yet have been transformed on the inside to essentially be Babylonians. They're taught Babylonian customs. They sort of fall in love with the Babylonian way of life. And then eventually they could be great people to serve uh, maybe in a positive way as like an envoy or an ambassador to Israel in the future. They've got a good relationship. They know sort of both sides. Or maybe in a more sinister way, you've got somebody trained up to be the perfect spy or double agent, somebody that has a history in Israel and knows what's going on there, but you have brainwashed them essentially to become a Babylonian at heart. And the the Babylonians do this in three different ways. First, 
They teach them the language and literature of Babylon. You see that in verse 4. Uh, basically, Daniel and his friends are taken out of their Christian school over in Jerusalem, taken into captivity into a foreign land where they're going to be taught things from a completely different worldview, the way of the Babylonians, the way that includes all of their traditions and their history and their way of thinking. But there's more than that. Babylon also changed their names. They're trying to change the entire identity of these Jewish boys. And so you've got people that started out with nice, sort of rich Bible names from their parents, and their names are changed. Daniel, whose name means God is my judge, his name is changed to Belteshazzar. Baal protects the king. Hananiah, which means God is gracious, is changed to Shadrach under the command of Aku the moon god. Mishael, there is none like God. Changed to Meshach, there is none like Aku. Azariah, God has helped me. Changed to Abednego, the servant of Nebo, the Babylonian god of wisdom. And so you see what's starting to take place as Babylon is scrubbing away the old remnants of their Jewish life and trying to transform them into a Babylonian way of thinking. And there's one other way that they seek to accomplish that. And that is by giving them food from the king's table. And uh, food from the king's table, this is, even here in America, it's around the dinner table where life tends to happen a lot, right? You want to go hang out with your friends? You go get dinner or coffee with them or whatever. Food has a way of bringing people together. And food in Babylon represented much of the Babylonian lifestyle. So they're not just trying to teach them their philosophy, but they're trying to get the Jews to buy into their lifestyle. And if you do that with the rich food and the good food, that's only going to make things better because now these Israelite children, they're not going to be like, well, all I get here is water and bread and it's like prison food. No, they're getting the best of the best so that the Babylonians are like, hey, you owe us. Don't try anything funny or you're going to end up, you know, with the bread and water. And so it has a way of sucking people in and think, hey, Babylon's not so bad. Let's just, you know, let's figure things out here. And before you know it, their name's changed, their education has changed, their lifestyle has changed, and now you've made yourself a brand new Babylonian kid. But they've got all the know-how from their past life as well, brainwashed to be used for the service of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It's genius, and uh, it's a part of what Daniel is involved in here, along with his friends. So, as I said before, there's 50 to 75 teenagers that are in this boat. We're given the names of four of them. That's because most of the Jewish people that were taken into captivity did not succeed, did not stand up, did not make a difference. What happened to them? Frankly, we don't know. I mean, they participated in this training program. They were probably inculcated into the Babylonian culture and lifestyle, and they served the purpose of Nebuchadnezzar. In short, their lives were pointless because they served a sinful king and compromised. There's four people that we do know about. They were useful to God. Their life served a purpose. And so we're asking the question, what does it take to live a life of purpose rather than a life that's pointless? And the first thing that we see from Daniel and his friends is that they were faithful through trials. Faithful through trials. Now you might be thinking, okay, that kind of sucks that they were being brainwashed. That sounds pretty bad, but it doesn't sound terrible, right? I mean, they get to eat cool food. They are, you know, it's like a semester abroad in a different country, and, you know, they're with their friends. Like, this could be, this isn't so bad. It's not like they're rotting in a jail cell. But I want to paint a picture, help you to put yourself in their shoes to help see what kind of a trial they were really facing. Put yourself in Daniel's shoes. He was ripped away from his family never to see them again. His family is probably dead, although if they weren't dead, they were back in Jerusalem where he would never get to return to. So he never gets to see his family anymore, and uh, all those ties are gone. He's taken away from his home, his nation, 
his favorite restaurants, his friends. He's brought into a whole new world against his will. Imagine just being taken captive, kidnapped, and sent over to a foreign land. What does that do to you? Next, Daniel's future was completely changed and many of his hopes and dreams probably crushed. For example, you see in verse 3 that they were placed under the command of Ashpenaz, the chief official. If you're reading an ESV, that says he was the chief eunuch. That's because many people who served in the court of the king were made eunuchs. If you don't know what a eunuch is, that's somebody who has been castrated. Their, their reproductive organs have been surgically removed or crushed. And any hope that a eunuch had of a family, kids, any sort of future like that, gone. Most scholars believe that Daniel would have been forced to become a eunuch as a part of this process as well. We don't know that. It doesn't say it specifically, but we never hear of Daniel marrying. We never hear of him having any kids. So Daniel was likely humiliated, scarred, and his hope for a future, hope for a family, was crushed. And then we've already talked about their new names It's Babylon scrubbing out everything that he knew and loved and replacing it with new things, new customs, new ideas, new gods. And what does that do to you? I think for many people, probably for many of the Jews that were taken over into Babylon, the response, it's the sort of thing that you hear when people go through trials today. They say, well, God already let us down. He let us down by making us get captured and taken over here. If he really wanted me to follow him, maybe he would have made things a little bit easier for me. But if my back is against the wall, there's nothing I can do. You know, at this point, God has let me down. I'm just going to go do my own thing. From now on, I'm looking out for number one, me. I think that's probably the way that most people react. They say, you know what? Screw God. I'm done with this. God has completely failed me. He hasn't protected me. He hasn't saved me. And now I'm just going to live the rest of my life for myself. But not Daniel. You don't see that with him. He remains faithful through trials. Now, if you're here and you're listening and you're thinking, you know, if I was presented with a trial like Daniel, frankly, I don't know that I could. I don't know that I could remain faithful like that. I mean, he's going through some serious stuff, and you might be thinking, I'm not up against half that much, and I'm already about to give up. And to you, I just want to say, listen, if you have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, then Jesus says to you, in John chapter 10, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And the Father who gave them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Christian life has less to do with you holding on to God and more to do with God holding on to you. If you truly are born again, I'm confident that any person in this room could face the type of trials that Daniel is up against. But maybe you need to have a prayer like the disciples prayed. They told Jesus, Lord, increase our faith in Luke chapter 17. And so I want you to think about, is there a situation where you feel like it's, it's really challenging or maybe even impossible for you to follow God? And in those situations, I want you to ask, God, increase my faith. Help me to have a life like Daniel's where I'm pursuing purpose rather than a life that's pointless. And when I think I can't move forward through a certain trial, through a situation, God, increase my faith. Help me to remain faithful through trials. The next thing we see from Daniel and his friends is not only that they were faithful through trials, but that they were settled in their convictions. Settled in their convictions. Read Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. So 
You might be asking, what's the deal with the royal food and wine? That's like the one perk of him being there. What's, why is this a bad thing? Well, for Israel, in the Old Testament, God had set up specific rules for them. And it was all a part of Israel being a nation that was different, set apart from other nations. And so as a part of this covenant, God told Israel, hey, I want you to be different from other nations. I want you to be set apart. And part of that is that I want you to abide by certain dietary rules. There are certain foods that are unclean. There are certain ways food is prepared that I don't want you to participate in. And there's food that's sacrificed to idols, and I don't want you to eat that. Now, all of those things would have probably been broken in some way in the Babylonian court. They didn't care about these dietary laws. That didn't make any sense to them. Now, for you and I, praise the Lord, we are under the new covenant, which Jesus initiates in the New Testament. You can read about it in Acts chapter 10, Mark chapter 7, verse 19, where Jesus says, all foods are clean now. You don't have to worry about some of these ceremonial laws and dietary restrictions that are in the Old Testament. That was for a period of Israel's history to help set them apart. And now, as Christians, we're to be set apart in a different way. Uh, set apart in the way that we act and in the way that we follow God and less to do with what we eat and what we don't eat. But for Daniel, living in a time before Jesus and before the new covenant, there was a clear line in scripture for him. And that was that you can't eat these foods that are unclean. You can't eat these foods that maybe have blood in them or that are prepared in a certain way. You can't eat foods that are sacrificed to idols. And Daniel's looking at God's word and he sees where God's word draws a line. And he says, I can't go past that line. And he tells the person in charge, hey, I would like to not eat these foods because they will defile me. And that word defile doesn't just mean that it's going to give him indigestion. It means that these foods are something that are going to make him unclean before God. So Daniel's saying it right how it is. He doesn't say, look, I'm vegan, and so I was hoping you could get a special diet for me. Do you have any gluten-free options? Daniel is saying, this would be sin for me to participate in this. And so, he tells the guy straight up, he's settled in his convictions, and it's because Daniel knew something that many of us forget. And it, this may sound like sort of a common sense, duh sort of statement, but I want you to make sure that you're applying this to your life, and that's this simple fact. God doesn't bless sin. He doesn't. And I think most of us might say, well, yeah, that makes sense. But then we get into other situations and it's like, oh, but what if I just fudged on a couple little things that aren't that big of a deal and that will help me get into a better position in the future? Like maybe the ends justify the means. And so, you know, with Daniel, what if I just follow through with these rules that, you know, it's kind of outside of my control anyway. And if I get in good enough with the king, then I can ascend to a higher position and maybe I could do real good for God in the future. No, Daniel recognizes that God doesn't bless sin. He doesn't now. He didn't then. He won't ever do that. And so if you're presented with something in your life where you're trying to justify sin because of some sort of future thing that you're hoping for, you need to realize God won't bless that. And we need to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to be settled in my convictions. I'm going to follow what God's word says. And even when I'm tempted to compromise in different ways, I'm going to stay true to what I know God wants for me. Daniel knew that he would rather be at odds with man and blameless with God than at odds with God and good with his captors, with other men. And so we need to recognize that as well. When you're thinking about your futures and people that you're hoping to impress and people that you don't want to offend with the gospel, you need to realize that it's better to be at odds with man and right with God than it is for you to be at odds with God and right with man. Last thing, Daniel was faithful through trials he was settled in his convictions, and he was tenacious under opposition. 
tenacious under opposition. We see that in Daniel chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. It says this, Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and waters to, water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the other young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Daniel is rejected initially. He knows the line that he doesn't want to cross, so he respectfully and graciously asks, hey, can you work with me? Uh, this would be sin for me. I don't want to cross this line. And the guard says, would love to help, but I can't. I'm sorry. Now, in a situation like that, most people would probably say, okay, I tried God. I did my best. I asked. I, I did what I thought was right. And it didn't work out. So I guess now I have permission from God to compromise because he's not giving me a way out. But Daniel's not like that. He remains tenacious under opposition. That word tenacious means he's not getting knocked out on the first punch. He doesn't drop the ball just because there's one person that's against him. He's looking for somebody else. He's talking to another people. When a door closes, Daniel's looking for a window. He's saying, hey, what can we do here? Daniel is probably resolved in his mind, I'm not going to cross this line. So it's either they get really mad at me for disobeying and I, they kill me, or I figure this out. And so Daniel's doing whatever he can, and he's getting creative. He's saying, okay, how about 10 days? 10 days, can you give me 10 days? How about we test this out? I get to have foods that are clean and okay for me to eat. I'll make it simple for you, just vegetables and water. We don't have to go through all of the you know, the complicated Jewish dietary laws, just give me vegetables and water, that'll be fine, and uh, give me 10 days to figure it out. So he's tenacious under opposition. And I think there's something for us to learn about this. If we want to live a life of purpose instead of a life that's pointless, it may mean that we need to show a little backbone in certain situations. Now, I'm not talking about like being creepy and continuing to ask a girl out even after she's rejected you 20 times. I'm talking about when you know that there's something right that you need to do, that God has asked you to do, or a line that you shouldn't cross, that you show a little backbone there. Maybe that means, hey, I know that God wants me to serve and be involved and be taught under the word of God on Sunday mornings when the church is gathered. And then you, you, you're all in on that. You think, yes, I'm going to participate in church. I'm going to be involved. And then you get a job. And your boss says, hey, guess what? Uh, you start Sunday, 8 o'clock a.m. Can't wait to see you there. And you say, oh, I was hoping to have Sundays off because church is a big deal for me. And he says, sorry, nothing I can do. Okay, God, guess you don't want me to go to church anymore. No. Maybe God wants you to show a little bit more backbone, get a little creative, or maybe even find a new job. Your life's not on the line. There could be other circumstances. Maybe you're sharing the gospel with somebody and they seem to reject you at first, you know, the first time you share it. Maybe God wants you to keep persisting, keep trying, keep working, doing what you know you should do, even if you're experiencing opposition. Look, there are some of you guys that I am just so proud of because you have taken a stand in various capacities at school or at home or even at church to do the right thing, to say something, to be bold for the gospel, to share your faith, whatever it is. And some of you are probably experiencing some opposition and maybe that isn't a sign that you should bail out because it's hard, but that you should be tenacious and hold on. Okay? I want to look now at some of the results of these character qualities. What happens when we live a life of purpose versus a life that's pointless? And we'll wrap things up here. First to review, Daniel was faithful through trials. He went through some intense trial and persecution. And I want you to ask yourself, what's the area where I find it really hard to follow God? And how can I be like the disciples in Luke, who said, Lord, increase our faith. 
Help me, God, in the midst of this trial to remain faithful through trial. Next, Daniel was settled in his convictions. He knew what he believed. He knew where the Bible drew the line. And he said, this is where I'm going to draw the line, right where the Bible does. And he was settled in that conviction. Is there somewhere in your life where you need to draw a line? Where you need to say, God's word tells me this. I'm going to obey that. I'm going to follow through with that, even when there's pressure to compromise. Maybe there's somewhere you've already crossed the line and you need to repent, confess that sin to God and maybe others who have been affected and turn around and start fresh. Lastly, Daniel was tenacious under opposition. He didn't cower and give up when he was initially rejected, but he was looking for other options. Is there anywhere in your life where you feel like God wants you to keep fighting to honor him, even if it seems impossible? Is there an area of your your life where you need to exhaust all of your options rather than just giving up after one failure? So, what's God's response to Daniel and his friends when they display these character qualities? God uses them. They're useful to God. Not just people that God uses in spite of themselves, but people that God takes joy in using because they have lived a life of purpose, not one that's pointless. There's between 50 and 75 other people in this story that were in the same boat as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. God doesn't use them, or at least he doesn't tell us in the Bible. But we can look at Daniel chapter 1, verses 14 through 20 to see the results of what happened. So he, that is the guard over Daniel and his friends, agreed to this, the test, and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. And in every manner of wisdom and understanding which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Listen, we see here that God not only preserves them through the immediate trial that they're going through and gives them the ability to not eat the royal food that they knew would have been sinful, but God also uses them in the future. He preserves them through the whole three years of their training program. And then... He blesses them. We already knew that Daniel was among the best and brightest of Israel because it said that at the beginning. He was taken captive along with all the best and the brightest and the most well-spoken. And now God blesses him with even more wisdom and understanding. And so Daniel goes from being somebody who's pretty smart to somebody who's genius. And it wasn't because he studied really hard and was smart. It was because God gifted him in that way. Now, he probably studied hard too, but... God gave him greater capacity because of his faithfulness. And to Daniel specifically, he gave him the ability to understand visions and dreams of all kinds. So Daniel's now like got superpowers, okay? And that's because God is blessing him. God doesn't bless sin, but God does bless faithfulness. And I do think it's important to note here that we often talk about heavenly rewards for following God, and rightly so. Heavenly rewards surpass any of this stuff, I think. Jesus says, store up treasure in heaven because there's nothing, no moth and rust that's going to destroy that or thieves that break in and steal or, or any of that. Sometimes, God not only gives heavenly rewards for obedience, he throws in some earthly rewards too. Daniel's a genius now, and the Bible attributes that specifically to his obedience to God. Daniel can interpret dreams and visions now. This makes me think that he would not have been able to do that had he compromised because it specifically attributes this to his faithfulness. And it makes me wonder, God, how many blessings am I missing out on? 
How many times might I have received something wonderful and beautiful from God, even something in this life, not even counting future reward, just because I compromised or because I wasn't faithful through trial or because I wasn't tenacious enough through opposition. Daniel was all of these things, and God rewards him not just future, but present as well. But here's the big thing to me. There's one verse in this chapter that has struck me more than any other verse. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be weird and distracting, and so I've just been asking that God would give me the right emotion as I talk about this. But I'll be honest, the, the next verse, every time I've practiced this message as I was studying, this moved me to tears many times. And it may sound bizarre because the verse is not one that you would normally cry about. It's the verse that says, Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Like, well, that's a weird verse to cry about, Andrew. Okay. But this verse tells us couple things specifically, and it implies a couple other things as well. And it's something that really moved me this week. First thing it tells us is that King Cyrus didn't come along until about 70 years after this point. So God preserved Daniel from when he was 13, 14, 15 years old for an additional 70 years. Daniel did not get killed because he didn't eat the king's meat. God preserved his life, and he lived a full life for the glory of God. And we're going to unpack that over the next six weeks, but it just makes me think, how much good can a person do when they have a life of faithfulness to God? That's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. That's the benefit that you have of being a young person here today. If you're 13, 14, 15 years old, you've got a lifetime ahead of you, Lord willing, should God give you another 70 years like he gave David, Daniel. And that could be a life fully given over to God and his kingdom and his work. How much could you do? How much of a difference could you make? What kind of purpose might you have in this world with that kind of longevity? This verse tells us something else. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Anybody know what nation King Cyrus was king of? It wasn't Babylon. It was Persia. Persia came after Babylon, which tells you that Daniel's reign his purpose, his usefulness wasn't contained just to one nation, to one political entity, to one group of people. Daniel didn't serve the kingdom of Israel. He didn't serve the kingdom of Babylon. He served the kingdom of God. And God's kingdom passes over Babylon and Persia and Israel and all kinds of kingdoms. And if you and I follow God and are servants of the kingdom of God, then your influence doesn't end with Des Moines, Iowa or with the United States of America. Whatever in the world happens to our nation and our world over your lifetime... God can work through any of that. The kingdom of God doesn't have boundaries and it, it crosses over politics and nationalities and languages. Daniel was a part of that because he was faithful. And you could be that way too. There's a couple other things that were not told specifically from the Bible. So I, I'm just warning you that this is not gospel truth, but it is a really good guess. There's another significant thing that happens the first year of King Cyrus. If you were to open up your Bible to the book of Ezra, chapter 1, you would read that the nation of Israel was allowed to return home from their captivity in the first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel... We're going to find out how he rises to power in Babylon and then in Persia. 
and he's set in positions of authority that are pretty much like second in command of the whole nation. And it just makes me wonder, you think Daniel had anything to do with Israel being able to go home after 70 years of captivity? I think he did. We're not told that specifically, but the fact that Daniel lasts until the very year that Israel is allowed to return home makes me think that God took this young man who was ripped away from his home and his friends and his family and he used him in a powerful way. And he was a part, probably the most important part of allowing Israel to go home. And Ezra goes home in the first year of King Cyrus. And Nehemiah follows a few years after him. And the walls of Israel are rebuilt. And there's spiritual revival that happens in God's nation. And all of it is because Daniel was faithful. He was useful to God. And God used him in a mighty, mighty way. Could that be you? Could you have that kind of level of impact? I think you could. If you're faithful to God. Last thing, just sort of as a PS. Hundreds of years later, there would be a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem who would be the savior of the world. His name is Jesus. He was visited by shepherds and angels and an odd group of people that are called magi, wise men from the east, the land of Babylon. Why in the world are dudes from Babylon looking at stars, wise men seeking out a Jewish Messiah? Bible doesn't tell us exactly, so this is just a guess. But I think Daniel had something to do with it. I think it was followers, disciples of Daniel generations later. Either way, the impact that Daniel had for the kingdom of God in his land meant that there were people looking for a Messiah in Babylon hundreds of years later. And they would come and offer gold, frankincense, and myrrh to their Savior. That's cool. And that's the legacy and the impact that someone can have when they choose a life of purpose rather than a life that's pointless. And that could be you, and that could be me. A life of purpose starts when we live in accordance with the will of our Creator, the way that God designed us. Augustine says that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God because we were created for him and nothing besides him can ever satisfy us. A life of purpose begins by following in the way that we were created, which is to worship God and follow Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you're here tonight and you're not following Jesus, then you need to start a relationship with Jesus tonight. And that happens when we confess our sin before God, repent of it, and say, I want to follow Jesus now. I'm not going to follow my old way of thinking, but I'm going to pursue a new master, a new Lord. That's why the book of Romans says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with you, your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. So I want to ask you, have you ever had a time in your life where you turned from your sin and began to walk in the purpose that you were created for, which is to follow Jesus? If you've never done that, we want to talk to you about how you can do that tonight. Purpose begins with a relationship with Christ, and we want to make sure that you know how you can form that relationship tonight. I'm going to pray, and we're going to split up into our small groups. If you don't know who your small group leader is, or this is your first week, I would love to come and talk with you, and we can get you in a small group and, and all of that. 
uh, leaders, their small group questions that are up here on the the music stand. And then uh, don't forget, we need to set up some tables and chairs in the auditorium after this, after your small groups. So do that quickly and then come back up to this room and we're going to celebrate. So let's, <laughs> we're going to celebrate. So let's pray. God in heaven, we're so grateful for Daniel, for the example that he was, for the fact that you raised up a man who was faithful under trial and settled in his convictions and who was tenacious under opposition. I pray that we would be like that and that you would raise us up to be people that make an impact, who are useful for the kingdom of God. I pray that you would use many students in this room, Lord. Help us to be people that make a difference because we're different. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.